internet friends, and welcome back to Love Hate Relationship, an opinionated podcast for opinionated people. I'm Andy Bowell. And I'm Alex Ruiz, and we're here to brighten your day, anger your soul, and tell you how to live your life. In that order. Hey, hey, hey. How you doing, man? I'm good. For everyone listening out there, I think you guys, I think it's February for all of you. Yes, this is the first episode in February. Okay, yeah. So y'all are probably thinking about, like, Valentine's Day and, and stuff like that coming up. For us, it's, like, just before Christmas, <laughs> and I'm like, ugh, I'm... I'm a little ready for the holidays to be over. Sure. Yeah, but I, it's and it's not a bad thing. I I have a little bit of an embarrassment of riches because this is like my first. This is my first baby's first Christmas away from, you know, Orlando and my parents and 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 all of that. So it's just kind of me and Stephanie up here on our own, and I'm like, I, we have an embarrassing number of gifts like <laughs> under our Christmas tree. I guess people are sending maybe people are sending us things just because they're like oh no they're by themselves here objects maybe maybe not i don't know but i'm just like whoo it's a little it's a little overwhelming and in its own way I, I can understand why you know just to get into the tiniest of micro hates christmas advertisement and jingles and stuff started playing the day after halloween i remember that because <laughs> i was yeah in, that fucking sucks i was in a pet shop buying food for my snake november 1st and there was christmas jingles playing and i was just like what the hell is going on i am definitely one of those people who uh laments that christmas era thanksgiving is so overlooked and the second halloween is done we're in christmas mode so yeah i mean if you think about it we've been it's been uh, almost two months of pure jingle jolly I don't have a third word then in J Ness. <laughs> joy? Yeah. Jingle Jubila- jolly joy. Ju- jubilation. There you go. I'm not gonna make the Jewish joke that just popped in my head. <laughs> um although speaking of which, I think it was Lewis Black had a bit where he's like, When I was a kid, Halloween was Halloween, not Christmas part one. Yeah. <laughs> which just always stuck in my head. Although, I don't, I don't know, because you're right. I did completely notice it more than ever that in, like, November, people were trying to do the the Christmas thing. And I, I, I'm I one of those December 1st guys. I'm like, I don't want to do any of this stuff until December 1st. And I love Christmas. Right. But I'm like, I, I don't want any. Th- and I'm usually willing to compromise. Like, okay, the day after Thanksgiving all right like i i won't be mad at people for that but when people started being like november 1st i was just sitting here going like no fuck you fuck no this is no longer about joy because by the end by the time christmas actually rolls around you are gonna hate all of this stuff it won't be special die in a fire i hate you (laughs) like it's not okay and if it and if and if it, it's allowed to go unchecked people will start dressing up like fucking santa for halloween and it's just gonna get worse, and I'm not okay with that. I'm like, we, I will compromise with Black Friday onward. I don't even care that much about Thanksgiving. I just don't want Christmas to be, you know, like a fifth of the year. Sure. No, Especially because I... my favorite holiday is New Year's, uh... and nobody gives a shit about New Year's. <laughs> no, correction. The only people who give a shit about New Year's are people who do New Year's resolutions. And... I don't do New Year's resolutions. I hate them. I think they're awful. I just think New Year's is just a really, really fun holiday. Like, there aren't that many holidays where it's literally just about, hey, this is ending. Hopefully, what's to come is better. Let's drink and have fun. Yeah. Like, there are very few holidays like that. And so I love New Year's. But most of the people who actually care about New Year's are the ones who are like, come January the 1st, I'm going to start eating right, and I'm going to start going to the gym, and I'm going to start cleaning the house once a week, and I'm going to balance my checkbook, even though, like, nobody balances their checkbook anymore. And, And I'm like, no, I appreciate all of you, like, setting arbitrary goals for yourselves, but statistically, you're not going to follow through on that i have known i was gonna say like like if by by the time you're listening to this uh if you were the kind of person who set a uh you know a goal for yourself on new year's 
Uh, you've been at it for a month now. How's that going? Maybe it's time to reflect. I will, I will say, I have never been like more proud to know a person than when... Uh, so, so my mother-in-law, Joanne... Hi, Joanne. Sometimes you listen. I know you do. She... I think it was... I think she gave up fries for an entire year for her New Year's resolution. And she actually kept to it. So much so that in, like, October, I was like, yo, how's it going not eating fries? And she's like, I'm eating more chips, but, like, no fries. <laughs> and she did it. And I was very proud of her. And I was like, cool. All right, you did it. I, I think the next year she gave up potato chips. So I... I might have that backwards. I might have it all wrong. I don't know. If I do, I apologize, Joanne. But shout out. You did great. I'm very proud of you for actually following through on a New Year's resolution. I don't believe in them. But, like, it's nice to know that there is, even if the percentage is very tiny, uh, some people who do follow through on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I I don't hate New Year's resolutions. It's just definitely my eyes are open to how bad they can actually be and you know you set a goal for yourself and then get caught up in the um self bashing when you inevitably fall short and i don't know i think i think my new year's resolution i've been thinking about for a while is to actually try to have a better social interaction with the people in my life and not be maybe so hermitous in regards to some people. So we'll see how that goes. I think that's a little better than promising myself that I'm going to work out three times a week. And then by February 1st date of, or uh, yeah, by, by the first week of February completely falling short of that and feeling shitty about myself. I mean, that's fair. I just goal setting is goal setting. I, 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 I... I'm a gym rat. January is the worst month sure. for being a gym rat because suddenly I'm like, oh, really, really? I got to wait 20 minutes for a squat rack because, you know, Arturo over here who has just decided randomly that he's going to exercise for the first time in his life is doing quarter squats in my rack. <laughs> it's just, it's okay. That's uh, maybe, and maybe that's me being unfair. Like I just, He's going to be gone in six weeks. He's not going to be there anymore. Right. And I'm just like, why do I have to wait? Why can't you quit now? <laughs> anyway, that's maybe that's that's me being ungenerous. But you know what? You know what? For all of you out there, it's February for you. So fuck Christmas spirit. Yeah, now we're in the thrall of Valentine's, which is a, <laughs> another, I, another mixed bag holiday emotionally. <laughs> See, I like Valentine's Day because Stephanie and I have a tradition where we don't do shit on Valentine's Day. We, like, we deliberately make Valentine's Day a, like, we're going to stay in and make it a special day for, like, just us. But we're not going to go out. We're not going to do anything, like, we're not going to deal with the crowds. We're not going to deal with, like, a lot of that pomp and circumstance kind of stuff. We make it, like, a an insular experience. And that has worked so well over the years that... I, I highly recommend that to any of you who are coupled and don't know what to do on Valentine's Day. Make it a really special chill evening, and it'll be so much less hassle and so much more fun. Throwing that out there. I'll have to try that. I've, I've, it just like I like, um, I, I like getting Christmas presents for people because I like having the perfect surprise ready. I, I, I tend to emotionally torture mariah by taking her out to a dinner and never letting her know where and then getting all happy when the night works out uh wonderfully but i will uh i'll have to think about doing a night in and making it special that way i'm just gonna say andrew like i love you dearly with all of my heart but if i were married to you and you pulled that shit on me i would punch you in the dick on an annual basis how's that for a valentine's day gift <laughs> i'm just saying i'm just saying I love you. There isn't there. There, if if multiverse theory is true, there are many universes in which you and I are coupled, That's true. married, and living a happy life. And in approximately all of them, I'm punching you in the dick on an annual basis <laughs> because you try and pull this stuff on me. <laughs> well, you've given me a lot to think about here. <laughs> That's fantastic. You want to get started? Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay. 
Um, real quick, just up at the top, um, because we should probably go over the format more than once every, like, nine episodes. Um, mm-hmm. This is Love-Hate Relationship. We do this ep- We do this show in three segments. The first segment, we talk about something we love deeply, passionately, and have a good discussion about it. The second segment, we talk about something we hate and all the reasons why it sucks. And then for the third segment, we take a question from you, our lovely audience, our beautiful listeners, about uh, some kind of relationship foible that you're dealing with, and we give you the best, tremendously unqualified advice we possibly can. Because we care. Because we care. So, Andy, it's your turn for the love. Uh, Do you want to go ahead and get us going? Yeah, let's get into it. We've talked on the show. It's funny. I feel like we tend to bounce around... Music, movies, comics, and something that isn't one of those other three things. At least for myself. You're a movie nerd, I'm a music nerd, we're both comic nerds, and we like other stuff too. Exactly. So this isn't the first time we've talked about movie-related stuff. Um, And this isn't even the first director we've talked about, but I think this is uh, the first director we have devoted a segment to. So today I would like to talk about how much I love Guillermo del Toro. Fantastic. Yeah. He is, for those of you who don't know, a Mexican director and a brilliant stylistic uh, auteur of the filmmaking craft. He, he has a, a style all his own and is just an altogether wonderful yeah. person. So to get into it, to get into the bio a little bit, we like to inform you uh, uh, educationally as much as emotionally. Del Toro was born October 9th, 1964 in Guadalajara, Mexico. And he always had a flair for filmmaking, even at a very young age. Uh, There are stories as a kid of him taking his father's Super 8 camera and trying to make movies even as young as, you know, 10, 11, 12. So it always seemed like this was going to be the path that Guillermo del Toro set for himself. He's most notable for his work on Pan's Labyrinth and The Shape of Water, which are the two movies that he has won Oscars for. And other highlights Mm. of his career include Pacific Rim. Today we are canceling the apocalypse! Rim, Crimson Peak, Blade 2 and the two Ron Perlman Hellboy movies. So Mm -hmm. at least one of those should ring a bell to you if you are a movie fan. And if not, then strap in, because we're going to get into why this guy is so fantastic. I will say, I think at least internationally, I mean, okay, yes, Pan's Labyrinth and Shape of Water are the big critical acclaim films. The Hellboy movies are certainly, I don't know, I might call them cult favorites, Uh, but the Pacific Rim movies are internationally just insanely huge yeah yeah like i'm like like i i have relatives overseas who have talked to me about pacific rim like that movie is enormous internationally even bigger than it is in the u.s yeah pacific rim was such an international hit um i believe that the second one they made a concerted effort to have more um, Asian, specifically Chinese characters, because the the first movie was just a massive super hit in China, even while it was a little bit of a critical failure in America. Yeah. So, I mean, there you go. He's he's both critically acclaimed in some ways and very commercially successful. Absolutely. Um, so he uh, he began his career by actually going to college for filmmaking and special effects. And his first job in the filmmaking industry was actually working on a Mexican horror and anthology TV show called and and I I, I don't have the Latin roots you do, so I'm going to try my best here. Would you like me yes, to say it? Go ahead. <laughs> La hora macarda, which is the the. Scary hour? The macabre the, the, the hour. The macabre hour? The, yeah. The macabre hour. Right, right, right. The macabre hour. Yes. Uh, so basically, it, it, it was sort of a, um, a Crypt Keeper type show, but in Mexico. <laughs> and it was actually a really big hit there and has some incredible names that worked on it. Uh, Guillermo del Toro worked on this show with fellow Mexican filmmaking superstars, uh, cinematographer Emmanuel Dubesky, who 
is known for the, being the filmmaker on The Revenant, and I believe also Birdman, and um, is just a, a, a phenomenal talent, as well as director Alfonso Cuaron, who is the genius behind Children of Men, and I want to say Gravity, um, and I think also The Revenant. In either case, these two are two of my favorite people in the filmmaking industry, along with Guillermo del Toro. And it's just, it, it's so interesting that this horror TV show was a little bit of a, um, a mixing pot of phenomenal filmmaking talent. A fun story um, about del Toro's time on, what was it, La Hora Macarda? Is that a butcher? La Hora Macarda. La Hora Macarda. Um, a fun fact or a fun little story of his time there. The, the actual, his first meeting with Alfonso Cuaron was they were working on an episode, which was a adaptation of a Stephen King short story. And Guillermo del Toro read the script, which was written by Alfonso Cuaron. And basically had, had never said hi to this guy. had never spoken to him before and turns to him and goes, why did you do such a shit job of this? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of guy that Guillermo del Toro is. And anyone familiar with his work, you understand that he he is a bit of a, a master of horror and a master of creepy, spookiness. So I think it stands to reason that he would have a very high opinion on the works of Stephen King and want to make sure that they were translated properly. So yeah, so he, uh, he worked on... That show for, I want to say, three years or so. And then finally was able to start writing and directing his own films. And the first one that got him a huge amount of acclaim was the Mexican horror movie The Devil's Backbone. And I'm not super familiar with The Devil's Backbone, but I have heard of it enough. And it is up there as it's up there with pan's labyrinth as like one of the breakout hits of this guy and is by all by all uh by all knowledge i know a, a phenomenal horror movie i've seen it on a lot of lists a lot of like international horror lists i have seen put devil's backbone down as like top 20 most underappreciated foreign horror movies or something like that so it's got a claim oh absolutely it it, it really was um, his breakout, at least within um, within Mexico and the United States, and and got him enough clout to then go on his very next his very next writing credit was actually the 2004 Hellboy, which was mm. his his commercial um, success. And then follow that up mm -hmm. with Pan's Labyrinth in 2006, which he won an Oscar for. And then that became his, you know, his critical success. So really, um, he wrote The Devil's Backbone in 2001. And within five years of really breaking into the film industry, the man has an Oscar and is suddenly one of the it names for directors and writers in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And yeah. all of Guillermo del Toro's work could be classified as dark fantasy. And anyone who has seen his work, you know what I'm talking about. His movies have a very specific style and look and feel and influence to them. And I would, I, I think dark fantasy is the best way to classify it. You know, Pan's Labyrinth is almost an Alice in Wonderland if it were a horror movie kind of vibe, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've often heard it described that way. Hellboy for being a comic book action superhero movie still has some incredibly horror graphic moments. And mm -hmm. I want to talk about that a little bit, that, that style, that look, that feel, because, because it is so um, entrenched in Guillermo del Toro's, persona and body of work i think it, it it just needs to be talked about as to why i like it so much i i guess it's a personal thing clearly 
we're talking about why I love it, but a lot of other people like it too. There's something about the creepiness and the spookiness and the horror more than just a straight up horror movie. Something that I really like about Guillermo del Toro, and I want to point to a horror movie he produced called Mama as this. Mm. Mama was a straight up monster horror jump scare movie. And it's mm-hmm. it, 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 it wasn't commercially received that well, but it, it was actually pretty critically received for a horror film. I thought it was phenomenally scary. It, it definitely checks all the boxes of things that I don't like. But not to get too much into spoilers for Mama, for anyone who wants to see it, there is a moment towards the ending where it breaks out of its own horror trappings and becomes all of a sudden very sympathetic and very fantastic, very fantasy. And to be able to do that, to be able to come in and out of genres as you please, I think is the mark of a very good filmmaker because not everyone can do that. You know, a horror movie is usually a horror movie or if it's like, say, a horror comedy, it's in there intentionally to be... Hello, officer. Good to see you again. Yeah. We have had a doozy of a day. A real doozy. Uh, Be a horror comedy. Sure. And, I mean, okay, so I'm thinking about... I'm thinking about the body of Guillermo del Toro movies and thematic or or rather um, pertinent themes that kind of resonate throughout the work and it always seems like del toro is very i don't know obsessed with the idea of creating sympathy and obvious monsters does that make sense like he's like i think how do i put this i'm trying to think of an i'm trying to think of someone i can of, of another filmmaker that I can kind of make a comparable assessment of. It's kind of like how, okay, so Chris Nolan, every Chris Nolan movie seems to be obsessed with the idea of perception. Perceiving memory, perceiving time, perceiving dimensions. All of his movies see, or even like self-perception, if you want to get into the Batman movies. Nolan is constantly obsessed with, we don't think enough about how we are perceiving the world in any given moment. Yeah. And that's, that's something I would say is definitely a through line throughout his career. Del Toro's obsession, uh, whether it's Hellboy, whether it's Blade... Whether it's to a cert- to a lesser degree Pacific Rim or to a very like obvious degree Shape of Water, it's who are your monsters? Yeah. What is a what is a monster? You a monster is monster is more complicated than we give it credit for. I think that seems to be the thesis of a lot of Del Toro works. Absolutely, to me, no, absolutely. I mean, to get to get a little spoilery, and this is my warning. I think that's absolutely true. And I look at a movie like Crimson Peak, which is a a very good ghost story, and the actual villain of Crimson Peak is not the terrifying ghosts, but it is you know, one of the human characters who is it turns out a psychotic murderer. So there's a lot of that to for for Mama to delve into that now that I've given a spoiler warning a little bit. You have the okay. the the Mama. You, I I I don't think she ever actually gets a real name or if it does if she does it doesn't matter. You have this grotesque, awful, terrifying ghost monster who it actually turns out is just driven to protect these two little girls that came under her care and all of the jump scares and all of the all of the hauntings and all of the attacks on the other adult characters in the film are really just out of a maternal instinct a maternal instinct of a horrifying monster but a maternal instinct and that absolutely humanizes the ghost the creature Mm -hmm. in a way that other movies aren't interested in doing yeah look at hellboy 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 is an adventure 
and it is a superhero movie, and it has comic elements, and it, it has some scary elements, but for the most part, it's not by any means a horror movie. I'd put it up there with Pacific Rim as one of the least horror films del toro worked on but part of the whole joke of hellboy is that the title character is a demon a a literal demonic monster but he's trying to do good he's trying to be a hero it's it's what you were talking about the subversion of what is a monster yeah no absolutely yeah something else that is prevalent throughout all of del toro's movies and this is where it really becomes clear that his special effects degree gets used to a very uh, a very awesome extent. He's very well known for his creature work. You know, Hellboy, you have the, the tentacle-headed monster dog things that are chasing Hellboy through most of the movie. Or to go into Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, some of the most iconic horror monsters came out of that movie and and the one that comes to mind specifically is del toro's take on the angel of death which was played by doug jones and is this beautiful terrifying creepy macabre angelic monster and looks just Mm -hmm. so fantastically cool part of the big draw of pacific rim i feel like is it's literally giant robots fighting giant monsters but again the giant monsters look so distinct and cool and visually dynamic and visually interesting and it's not just a bunch of godzilla looking things but it's these truly bizarre alien monsters and del toro designed pretty much all of these or at least had had his fingers in helping design all of these creatures he definitely like i feel like you can tell talking about del toro's visual style is a tricky thing to nail down because you can kind of always tell like it's kind of like hr geiger you can Mm. always tell an hr geiger monster like you see anything hr geiger does whether it's the alien and aliens or just like his paintings like you can always tell his work with del toro you can usually tell a del toro monster like if you look at the creature in Shape of Water versus, like, a lot of those Hellboy designs, you do... Co- or even or Pan's Labyrinth, I mean... Oh, yeah, we haven't even talked about Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, Jesus, Pan's Labyrinth. But, yeah, it's always... It's got a very... I, I, I'm trying to find the through line. It, like, if I had to describe H.R. Geiger, I would probably <laughs> describe it as, like... Teeth and soft flesh. Yeah. <laughs> Messy. Like, it's just whole whole bodies made of teeth and soft flesh. It's angular, but has a, a very disturbing softness. It's, it's guts on the outside. It's, and it's sharp, and it's angular, and it looks painful. Del Toro... I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of how I would describe Del Toro monsters. Like, lots of, what, flaps? Lots of scaliness. Like, I, I don't even know. It's hard. Would, it's hard to nail it down. But you know it when you see it, you know? Yeah, I would, I would describe Del Toro's monsters as off more than anything. It's because, I mean, I mean they, they range from creatures that are beautiful to look at. Let's talk about the Angel mm-hmm. of Death. Let's talk about the Amphibian Man in Shape of Water. These are things that are aesthetically pleasing, but 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 off. There there's something wrong. And looking at the Pale Man from uh, from Pan's Labyrinth, looking at Mama, which he was the producer on and and had stylistic mm-hmm. input. The the worst thing about Mama is that all of its limbs are wrong, and it's. Um, I don't know if you've seen The Haunting of Hill House yet, Netflix. Uh, no. Um, no, I haven't. Well, minor aesthetic spoilers for The Haunting of Hill House for anyone who hasn't watched it. There is a ghost in there called the Bent Neck Woman. And the Bent Neck Woman's deal is that her head is bent at a 
particularly unsettling angle. And mom is very much the same way. You, you, you watch the movie, you look at her, and she is just off. Her face is twisted in this bizarre way. The way she walks is she walks on all fours, but like it's this weird spider crawl. Her her legs are like over her shoulders in a, in a weird way. It's it, it, it's hard to describe through words, but the best thing I would say is that it's off. There's a wrongness to it. And mm-hmm. that, I, I would follow that even with the stuff in Pacific Rim. So, yeah, I mean, I flaps scales yeah to an extent but the word i would use I, is wrong yeah i mean that's me trying to just sure, throw stuff sure. at the wall and see what fits i do think it's interesting that um you just named four characters in a row and three of them are played by are all played by doug that's jones true. that's true and anyone out there who uh, finds this at all interesting, I highly recommend look up the career of Doug Jones. Doug Jones was Andy Serkis before Andy Serkis. Yeah. Doug Jones is like a practical effects Andy Serkis because Doug Jones is terrifyingly tall, has forearms as long as my legs, <laughs> and he's played char- he played um, Billy the zombie in Hocus That's Pocus. True, yeah. He played the Silver Surfer in the second Fantastic Four movie, but he also played the Pale Man. He also played. The creature in the shape of water. Um, did he play Abe Sapien in he Hellboy? Was both, Do I have yeah, that right? Yeah, he was both Abe Sapien and he was the Angel of Death. Yeah, like he he is so like, and if you just looked at him just out and about, you would just go, man, that's just one really tall dude. But he like slathered in makeup and put into like just weird. He's also I think a contortionist, so he can just do crazy ass shit with his body. Yeah. He he's he's this fascinating actor who you know rarely gets lines in most of the movies he does, but he's so just perfect at bringing to life these outs. I think I think off is a good way to put it. Like he he by himself looks off. He looks like it. He looks like an Ellen Gated man. Yeah, not the Ellen Gated man, but an Ellen Gated man. And and he lends just something so intriguing bodily to all of these characters. So him and Del Toro kind of working together to bring a lot of this stuff to life kind of makes sense, you know? Yeah, and, and while, we're, while we're giving some love to Doug Jones, I also want to give some love to the man who is going to go down in history as his successor, and that is another actor named Javier Botet. And Javier Botet is even more elongated than Doug Jones and has <laughs> really, I mean, he is, he's, he's taken up the mantle. He, he plays the, the ghost in Mama. He plays Mama. He plays um, most of the ghosts in Crimson Peak. He, um, to list some of his, uh, some of his other stuff, he, um, he was the leper in It. He was, um... Mm. In the latest Alien movie, Alien Covenant, he was the mo- mocap actor for the aliens, and he was uh, the the titular monster in the latest Insidious movie, The Last Key, which was kind of a piece of shit, but he was good in it. So okay, fair enough. And and so you've, you we've tapped into something interesting here. I think we've listed two of the three most pro- prolific physical character actors of our time. As far as I know, Guillermo del Toro really hasn't worked with Andy Serkis that much, but Doug Jones and Javier Botet kept finding work in Guillermo del Toro's films because they're the people who could physically represent the the crazy nightmarish shit going on in del Toro's head. So I think that yeah. helps describe his creature style, that he needed to find these people to play his monsters that could do things and were so physically unique beyond really anyone else. Yeah. And it's fascinating because like I have heard very stupid people (laughs) who don't know anything about physical acting kind of put down Andy Serkis as a performer. That's a shame. Discussing like that. He, I mean that he does so much mocap. 
I've often wondered if maybe part of the reason he played Claw in the Marvel movies was so that he could kind of showcase that, no, it, as a matter of fact, he is a very, very marvelous, like, charming, even effacing, even fascinating, um, you know, straightforward yeah. actor as well. But a lot of why Andy Serkis, like, a lot of why so many of his characters are so interesting or enduring is because, like, motion capture is motion capture. It really... It, it, and, it, and if you need an example for what doesn't work, look at the Eric Bana Hulk sure. movie, where they mo-capped Eric Bana for, a lot of, for those Hulk sequences, and it's terrible because Eric Bana is not a face guy. Eric Bana's a fine actor. I got nothing to, get to say against Eric Bana, really. But that movie did such a shit job with its motion capture and creating any kind of emotion or translating any emotion from Eric Bana, who, let's be fair, is not the most facial of actors. Whereas Andy Serkis, in all of that motion capture, does an incredible performance that translates through beautifully into the animation. And I feel like Doug, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the, with the other person that you listed, but... I think that's very true of Doug Jones's work. Like, the uh, his ability to put through that kind of emotional performance into those into, into that heavy effects, and a lot of it's practical effects with some like editing and CGI. Like his ability to create that just in body language, in in motion, is really really astounding, and the kind of thing that someone like del toro who i think is obsessed with the idea of you know creating that physicality in his monsters i think it's essential for him i don't know how much of that is direction and how much of that is the actor it's probably a combination of the two but sorry i'm just bringing this trying to bring this back to del toro and really <laughs> just where no honestly where those actors that he continues to work with and and where that physicality is so essential to telling those character arcs and tell and character stories. And I think that's something he looks for. Sure. No, I agree. And, and so, so one last um, person we can look at is actually Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. Is the, <laughs> seriously, seriously. I, I, I have a point here. No, I, lo- I, 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 I agree with you at the point. I'm just like, I, I think of Ron Perlman and I'm, I'm immediately my head flashes back to, him as him as the beast yeah. in the Beauty and the Beast TV show, <laughs> right. and I'm sorry. This is where the wealthy and the powerful rule. Hey, it fucking makes me laugh. Oh, that's so. fair. That's very fair. <laughs> Ron Perlman. He's a great actor. Don't get me wrong. Like he is a fantastic actor. He's brilliant. He's a fun Twitter follow. I highly recommend him. But like, yeah, he's so, great. So yeah, please go on. Well, so Ron Perlman. I mean, he also has a head that looks like it was chiseled out of a cinder block. Yeah, no, and like. I don't think that's unkind to say. It's it's just he, the, the man has a, a, an enormous head. <laughs> Ron Perlman but, looks like you would punch him in the chin and hurt yourself. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but uh, he and Guillermo del Toro are great friends. They worked together on Blade 2. And then uh, Ron Perlman was Guillermo del Toro's only choice to play Hellboy in Hellboys 1 and 2. And unfortunately, we're never going to get... Uh, Ron Perlman's Hellboy 3, but Del Toro very much wanted to make it. My point is, he has... He he is a phenomenal actor. He has this incredibly expressive face, despite, uh, you know, we're making jokes about how large his head and how big his face is. Um, I want to point out, the trailer for the new rebooted Hellboy um, has just come out. And that Hellboy is... I'm blanking on the name, but it's Hopper from Stranger Things. It's David Harbour. Yeah, David David Harbour. Harbour. That's right. And just looking at the trailer, something I've noticed already is it looks like there might be more makeup or different sort of makeup or something. And Hellboy himself looks less expressive. He, He looks... It, I, I'm going to be very curious to actually watch the film and see how Hellboy emotes because Ron Perlman could do that. He could he could bring Hellboy facially to life in in a very human way. And so there is yet another favorite actor of Guillermo del Toro, someone who works with him again and again and again. 
And it's because he could do these things physically to help bring the character to life. I, th- I think that's incredibly important to Del Toro. Mm-hmm. So m- yeah, moving on, I'd just like to talk, because I feel like you're going to have some things to say about this. Uh, you know, we've talked about themes of Del Toro and something else that is a huge theme in Del Toro's movie is how he deals with religion. Now, Guillermo Del Toro was raised Roman Catholic, but describes his religious upbringing as morbid. And now he uh, he is a self-proclaimed atheist and his atheism, as well as his anti-authoritarianism really comes out in a lot of his stories to go back to Pan's Labyrinth. And this is also true of Devil's Backbone. The villains are Francoist Spanish soldiers. And he very much um, in his real life, Del Toro attributes part of the reason he, uh, he lost his religion is he saw what the Catholic church did with Francoist Spain in the 40s and 50s and sort of the blind eye that they they gave to this totalitarian semi-fascist government and that affected him so strongly and became part of the breaking point for him and and mm. you know neither of us were around for it but Franco as Spain was a big deal. We talked last episode on the David Bowie episode how when General Francisco Franco died, it became a national story because people wanted to get the reaction of the people of Spain now that this dictator was dead. You know, you look at Pan's Labyrinth the big one because the the true antagonist of Pan's Labyrinth is a is a Francoist, I want to, I want to say captain or maybe general, but you know, this, this awful man and it keeps coming up in his work, even to take it to modern um, shape of water, which takes place in America. One of the most interesting things about shape of water to me is the morality that Del Toro gave to his characters. And again, very, very minor spoilers. If you care, maybe skip ahead. But the thing about shape of water is the American government spooks were the authoritarian bad guys. And one of the heroes of the entire story winds up being a Soviet sleeper agent. And it's like, that's not how we normally divvy up the heroes and villains of that particular conflict. Yeah. And I mean, doesn't help that you know the uh head antagonist uh (laughs) u.s agent is played by michael shannon who is the best villain of all time i I knew you were gonna say that (laughs) i just i just i would i like michael shannon is the perfect villain in everything always like nobody plays terrifying white man quite like michael shannon if you just open this like i told you to tie yourself down to whatever chair you're sitting in because this email is going to be a rough fucking ride. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean... I'd like, to, uh, uh, I, I'd like to wrap up by just touching on um, Del Toro is most well known for being a filmmaker, but he's actually branched out into several different mediums. He wrote a book series with author Chuck Hogan called The Strain, which has since been made into a TV show. And I, I'm, at, I'm looking at them right now. I own all three of the Strain books. They're actually a fantastic uh, trilogy of novels. And his stated goal of the Strain series was to make vampires scary again. Because he was, he was ticked off at Twilight and the, the romantic trend that vampires had been going on. And he was like, no, these things are terrifying monsters. Here, I'll show you. And Mm -hmm. managed to do that. He also has broken into video games recently. He has developed a friendship with video game uh, legend Hideo Kojima, who is the guy who created Silent Hill, um, among other things. And Del Toro actually served as director for um, something called P.T., and I know you're not huge on video games, Alex, and, and some other people in our audience won't be. PT was a beta. It was, it was a trailer for a game that you could play. And 
it it actually took the video game world by storm by just sort of popping up out of nowhere and being one of the scariest things that video games had had in a while. I can remember playing it with friends. I can remember watching other people play through it. It's it's disturbing and terrifying and and something special all on its own if you're into that sort of thing. And Del Toro had a huge hand in that. And I, I think that's that's really amazing and it really speaks to his talent to branch out into other mediums. Is there like a dying baby in there? Or? No, he's fine. He's probably fine. <laughs> What was that? So yeah, the, the very last thing I'd like to say, and, and I was sort of reflecting on this. I I love Guillermo del Toro. And I think it's important, or maybe if it's not important, it is it it is it is something that is important to me that one of my absolute favorite director, writer, producer, people in the industry is somebody who is not American. You know, Del Toro is one of the few names that puts my butt in the theater. And I was thinking about this. One of my other favorite directors is Korean director Chan Wook Park, who is the genius okay. behind Old Boy. And I guess, like I was just saying, it's important to me, and, and I think it is an important thing in general to be interested in multiculturalism and to not be caught up in not liking something because it's necessarily foreign. So just wanted to throw that out there. No, actually, you know what? I appreciate that. Um, I think my, my last note on this is just going to be, I remember when Pan's Labyrinth broke and people were just starting to pay real proper attention to Guillermo del Toro. And I don't know if you've noticed this lightening up. I, I feel like it depends on who I talk to. But I remember growing up with a lot of people who would say, like, I would never watch a movie with subtitles. I hate movies with subtitles. Exactly, so right. People, people who watch movies with subtitles are pretentious assholes. And I feel like that's lessened in a lot of ways. And I remember Pan's Labyrinth being the first foreign language film. Like, when that came out, I remember people talking to me about it and saying... And, and I watched it, and I'm like, you know, my Spanish is good um it's not perfect i think if i had watched that movie without subtitles i would have missed a lot um because yeah. it's not exactly the you know middle school level spanish that i speak or high school level spanish that i speak i but i feel like that was the first time that i had people who as far as i knew had never watched a foreign film before never watched a movie with subtitles who watched a movie with subtitles came back and said like that movie was fucking fantastic. It's one of my favorite movies. Like, Del Toro, for many reasons, had a crossover appeal that I feel has reverberated since his debut in a really positive way. And some of that has linked to a lot of the themes in his works, a lot of the anti-authoritarianism. Um, I have a very... I have a strong reading of The Shape of Water that, you know, maybe someday we can talk about in some capacity sure. uh, where it's an indictment of uh, toxic masculinity. Hmm. We'll talk about it sometime. But I find Del Toro's work to be important. Yeah. I, 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 and, not, and, and more than important, it's fucking enjoyable. And he does his thing. I, I don't subscribe to auteur theory very much, but he does his thing. And they're, for the most part, very solid work. So anytime you get someone who can throw positive themes create a body of work with a sound philosophical presence is his own thing is very unique and it's fucking good that's really the best anyone can hope for from a particular artist so i i thank you for bringing guillermo del toro into this podcast uh i enjoy his work thoroughly uh he's by no means been a favorite director of mine but i've always appreciated his work i've never seen a move well, that's not true i didn't love golden circle <laughs> um it was fine i like the first one better but sure. point is i i've never seen a guillermo del toro movie that i actively disliked yeah i haven't seen every movie we've talked about today i haven't seen um what's it called crimson crimson peak, peak is friggin' dope yeah have not seen that um but i mean like and i haven't seen devil's backbone but i i appreciate you bringing this up so thank you, my friend. Uh, 
I, I kind of want to talk more directors with you in the future. Like this is, this is an absolute blast. I kind of sat back a lot and let you do a lot of the talking because I was just interested in what you had to say. Well, yay. Hey, you're very welcome, Yay. man. I will I will talk shop with you on directors, cinematographers. I will I will be happy to talk at you more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet boy. It's all good, uh, man. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah, I feel like uh, I, I'm glad this has been so enjoyable, but I've I've taken up the bulk of our time yet again. Uh, eh, you good. So let's get into the hate. You good? No worries. Okay, hey, this one is my turn. So you've all read the title. You know what we're going to get into, but as always, I like to always start my segments regardless by asking Andy a question. So, Andy, I sent this to you ahead of time, but I'm going to go ahead and just ask you straight up um, because it's one of two things. I want to talk about the bench press today, specifically the exercise. So I'm going to ask you, Andy, has there ever been an occasion where you have been asked or heard or witnessed a situation where someone has asked you or somebody else around you how much do you bench you know not really what does that question elicit to you like that that exact question asking someone how much do you bench it is what do you think of someone who asked that sure sure i mean what it elicits in me it is a it is a sounding board for how tough are you bro How, how strong are you man where do you Ugh. physically compare to me, the asker? And mm. you know, it is a, it, it's a, what, what's, what's your, what's your power level? What's what? How strong are you? <laughs> what's your power? <laughs> oh God! There's an over nine thousand joke to make here. And I'll make it. But Jada, what does the scouter say about his power level? Ah, oh, Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> okay. No, that's perfect. Um, and that and that actually sums this up nicely. I despise the meme that the bench press has become. Okay. I I mentioned up here at the top, and longtime listeners know, I'm a gym rat. I'm a big fan of the sport of weightlifting, specifically Olympic weightlifting, which I'm not going to go into detail about here. But I will just say, when I tell people that I'm a weightlifter, when I tell people that I am someone who actively enjoys resistance training as a hobby, I get asked that fucking question so many times. And it is so frustrating because I don't bench. I don't bench press at all. In fact, I actively avoid that exercise. And I want to talk a little bit about why I avoid it. And I also want to talk about what it is in the culture and what it means in the culture. So uh, as always, a little bit of background. And I'm specifically talking about the barbell bench press, the exercise of lying down on a bench, taking a loaded barbell at an extended arm, bringing it down to the chest, and pushing it back up. So, Andy, uh, little history, because this actually does have a history. It's not just something that's existed forever. The barbell bench press, as we know it now, as I just described it to you, actually only came into existence in the last century or so. Before that, the closest thing you had to it was an exercise called a floor press, where you would lay on the floor, you would roll the bar roughly over your face and press it from there. Huh. It was, yeah, it was a minor accessory lift at best. Like maybe you're like, oh, I have some weak triceps, maybe I'll do some floor pressing. That was really the extent of it. In those early days, the primary upper body barbell exercise, the one that people would do to actually get strong, and the one that people would ask you about to kind of, as you said, ask your power level, kind of gauge things, was the standing overhead press, which is where you're holding the bar, you're standing on your feet, you're holding the barbell roughly at your chest, you press it overhead to lock out, and then bring it back down. In my, in my sport of choice, in Olympic weightlifting, this was actually a contested lift until 1972. You, you did a movement called the clean and press, where you would clean the weight, that is, bring it from the floor to your chest, and then you would press it overhead. It was removed in 1972 for a number of reasons that I'm not gonna get into, but, but the point is that was kind of the lift of choice. Around the time that it was removed from Olympic lifting, bodybuilding became the most famous barbell-ish sport. This was around the time of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno's pumping iron. Okay. 
Uh, you had a lot of the Arthur Jones, Nautilus, weight systems things going around. And, and bodybuilding became something that took up a lot of attention in the popular world. And bodybuilders famously bench pressed a lot and often because it's a, it, because it's an important developer for chest muscles. It, it's the, you know, your chesticles, the, the, the pecs, pectorals, yeah, just the, the big old pushing them out. Like, yeah, the bench press would go a long way in emphasizing those. Bodybuilders bench pressed a lot. Schwarzenegger talked about bench pressing a lot. I'm getting the feeling of coming. And so the bench press kind of became this weird new standby. And, and again, at the time, it was just kind of a eh, bench press. I guess it's an exercise. By this point, uh, powerlifting did exist as a sport. And powerlifting is like weightlifting in that it is a barbell sport in which you compete to see who can lift the most for a single rep in several exercises. In powerlifting, it's the barbell back squat, the barbell bench press, and the deadlift. So that existed. But bench pressing kind of entered common culture in the 70s. The standing press kind of fell out of favor and and asking people what do you bench became the common thing. Here's the problem. The barbell bench press kind of sucks as an exercise. <laughs> Poor, performed without proper instruction as to bar path, uh, unlike most barbell exercises, if you just straight up have a barbell over your shoulders and push it up and down in a straight line, you will it's not a question. It's not you might. You will saw through your rotator cuff. Oh. Uh, you will impinge your shoulders. You a bar, uh, The proper way to do a barbell bench press, you actually need to bring it down closer to your sternum and then press it back up to avoid this. Because if you do it straight up and down, you will 100% ask old school power lifters who needed to have rotator cuff surgery in the 80s and 90s. You will saw through your rotator cuff if you do that. In weightlifting, not even just weightlifting, in the act of lifting weights, in resistance training, there's about 5 to 15 deaths per year of people who are practicing the act of actively lifting weights who will die. Those people, almost all of them die by bench pressing by themselves. If you are squatting with a barbell, if you are pressing a barbell overhead, if it's too heavy, if, if, it, if you lose control of it, you drop it. Maybe you fuck up your floor. Maybe you, like, throw your shoulder out of whack. Or maybe you might pull a muscle in a hamstring if you're doing it wrong. But a bench press, if you drop a bench press, you drop it on your face. Right. You drop it in your mouth. You drop it on your chest. Ugh. If you get, if you get, yeah, if you get pinned under a heavy one and you are by yourself, you don't have a spotter, you don't, you're not doing it in a squat rack with arms where it can rest you will suffocate. You get it on your throat. This is how people die is by, uh, granted, I, I will fully disclose, these are people who are bench pressing incorrectly. They're doing it in a really unsafe, problematic manner. There is a thumbless grip that is used in some exercises uh, where you don't wrap your thumb around. Some argue that it increases forearm activation. Uh, there are people who bench press with this grip. In such a manner, it is nicknamed the suicide grip. Because if your fingers give way, you drop a barbell on your fucking face. <laughs> this is how people die. The barbell bench press has killed more people than literally any other exercise known to man. And people still fucking give it some credence. And at the end of the day, its actual usefulness to any kind of strength building, to any kind of athletic ability, is almost nil. Andy, okay, you're a hockey guy. I know hockey yeah. has a combine. Correct. Does the do you know if the hockey combine includes bench pressing the way the football combine does? I don't believe so. The the ones that come to mind are it's it's a lot about the 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 thing where you you bike with the oxygen mask and you, you, know, okay. you go as hard as you can for as long as you can. Um, I know chin ups are involved. I know pull ups are involved. Good. I know. You do the thing where you jump as high as you can and, and hit the thing to see what your 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 jump is. I don't standing vertical jump. Standing vertical okay. jump. Okay. I don't believe that upper body weightlifting is actually all that important. And I don't even know, thinking about it, if um, 
it's focused on by the actual hockey players when they practice and you know do physical exercise it's very much more about leg presses and that sort of thing see that sounds remarkably intelligent for those of you who don't know uh, a combine is a series of exercises that are tested for new recruits in sports uh, and they use it to kind of assess how athletically capable or what the potential of a particular athlete will be and recruiters for professional teams and college teams will use these tests in order to kind of gauge how viable a candidate is. The football combine includes a 225 pound bench press test, which is just, you load up 225 pounds on a bench press, that's a 45 pound barbell with two 45 pound plates on each side, and just say, and you just go, how many reps can somebody do with this? And if, you're confused as to what, like, if that makes sense to you, that a football player would need to bench press 225 pounds a whole bunch of times, if that makes sense to you, please explain your logic, because <laughs> I don't get it. I don't fucking get that at all. Like, it's useless, okay? It has no correlation to throwing ability, I promise you. I can show you the scientific papers. I've read them. I'm a fucking nerd about this. <laughs> the overhead standing press is significantly more useful the squat and the power clean are significantly better indicators of leg strength and overall power, as is the standing vertical jump. The barbell bench press is useless in this regard, but we test it for some reason. We think that if our football players, like at what point in a football game do you lie on your back and push upward when you're on the bottom of a mound? When? It's, I, it's, it's an athletically useless exercise. Sure, and, and you got me curious, so I looked it up. Unfortunately, um, uh, the bench press is part of the NHL Combine, specifically the <laughs> maximum power test. So what, it's for, you, you do your one rep maximum on a bench press? Um, so it says here, athletes bench press 50% of their body weight as quickly as possible for three reps with maximum power measured by a device that measures that. Eh. That is stupid as hell. <laughs> well, now I, now I agree with you, now that I have a, a better understanding. And I'll, let's see if, if this this is just numbers to me, but I hope it means something to you. Uh, in, the two, in the 2018 NHL Combine, the best result was 8.25 watts per kilogram. Okay. So I don't know, I don't know how that factors into good or bad, but that's, that's what the best young NHL athlete could do in the past year. I mean, that's, that is athletically very impressive. That's, that's, that's an impressive number for that. I would really like to know what that particular athlete could power clean. I would like to know what their standing vertical jump is. I would like to know what their long jump sure. is. Those are significantly more useful measures of athletic ability than fucking lying on your back and moving a barbell up and down. Right, because to go to your earlier point, I can't figure out a time when an NHLer would need to do that motion with their power behind them in a game, except if they're throwing a check. And to throw a check in that arm pushing forward manner that's called a cross check that's illegal as hell so i don't i don't have an answer for you as to why that uh exercise is actually relevant fire save oh. he goes crashing into the boards the lightning object to that hit from johnson a penalty was upcoming against the abs well and let me ask you this in that particular motion illegal or not is someone's back pressed up against a wall or the floor not the no not the person doing the motion Okay, so here's the, here's the difference between a bench press and a standing overhead press. In a bench press, the kinetic chain, the actual point of fixation in gravity, and the object being moved is the, is the back, specifically right behind where the arms are, and the barbell. That's the entire kinetic chain. Whereas in a standing overhead press, the kinetic chain starts at the feet and goes to the object in the hands. So if you're pushing something, if you're throwing something, anyone who's ever thrown a punch, thrown a ball, uh, Andy, if you've ever thrown a cable to somebody while you're doing your production work, do you lean your back? What is, what is a stronger motion? Leaning your back against an object and throwing 
or grounding your feet and throwing using a flick of the hips. Yeah, the second one, obviously. Exactly. And a standing overhead press will train that shit significantly better than a barbell bench press. Like, the only... It's funny, because the, the, the first book I ever read on uh, heavy weight training talked about the bench press, and, and it did include the bench press mainly as an accessory to the standing overhead press. Uh, and the best, the best illustration I ever saw was it had a cartoon of Santa, like, crawling up and down a <laughs> chimney. Basically as, this is probably the most relevant use for bench pressing muscles, <laughs> is crawling up and down a fucking <laughs> chimney. I, it's a, so it's an exercise that is arguably completely useless for athletic purposes. The only thing it really does is it's a good accessory for other more useful exercises. It's actively dangerous, especially if it's coached improperly or done poorly. And it is, for some reason, the standard by which so many people, especially gym bros, right. which are already a problematic population that I have a lot of trouble dealing with. It's, it's the measure that they use, you know? I, 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 I get asked this question, what do I bench? I don't fucking bench, but, the, and that is treated as some kind of measure of my athletic ability. And that's so problematic because I don't ask people to give a shit about barbell sports. I don't ask people to really care that much about something that I care about a lot, my hobby, about the sport of weightlifting. But I really, really don't like this ignorant idea. Like, how many people... We're talking about New Year's resolutions earlier. How many people are going to walk into a gym in, uh, in January who have already, by the time you all are listening to this, have been sitting in gyms in January trying to bench press weights thinking that that's something useful to their right. health because they don't know any better, because the culture has taught them this is a useful exercise when it's actively one of the most dangerous one of the least useful for just about anything. Like, and I wonder. I, I have a problem with that. You wonder? No, so totally. I, I sit here and wonder how much of this is just, you know, back in the '80s, sports medicine or, or or whatever thought that this was the thing to do, and decided to do it, and just how much of it is toxic masculine dude bro culture, being like, no, this is the thing that 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 looks the coolest and this is the thing that that I'm I'm right and I'm not going to do the other thing. You know, I, I, I also wonder how much how much the media and pop culture has hyped up the bench press because I sit here and I, I try to think like it's 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 probably better in a movie or a TV show if you need two characters talking for one another if it's done and it has to be done in a gym like that if it's if it's done with a bench press because you have the second character serves as the spotter and that's that that way you can get dialogue and that's probably easier than having the other dude do an overhead press and trying to film the same scene and I just I sit here and wonder because I, I I agree completely you've educated me on why this is wrong I wonder how much is just this is the way we've done it. This is the way we've always seen it done. There's a stereotype that this is the tougher, more badass way of lifting weights, and that's what we're going to do now. Yeah. I mean, I, okay, so we talked about Daredevil a couple of episodes ago. Uh, spoilers for season oh, two yeah, of Daredevil. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah there's, there's a scene where the Punisher meets Wilson Fisk in prison, and Wilson Fisk is by himself in a prison yard. And he's benching. And I counted the weight on that. Like, I, I, I lift enough weights and I watch the sport enough that I can kind of see it at a oh, glance. I love you. He's benching, he's, he's benching 495 pounds. And Punisher walks up and Wilson Fisk is, just finishes his bench press. He's got no spotter. He's just hanging out. And then he sits up. And I'm sitting here going like, okay, Wilson Fisk is a very intelligent man <laughs> who, yes, actually, in the comics even canonically is very athletic and very strong yeah. and knows what he's doing in all of this, Wilson Fisk would not waste his time bench pressing that frequently. It would be way more productive and useful. Every time I see a Batman comic where he's benching, I'm like, Batman would not bench that much. Batman wouldn't give a <laughs> shit about benching. 
I know several exercises Batman would rather do because Batman only sleeps three hours a night, canonically, and he trains for, like, another two hours, so he would de definitely be using other exercises that are significantly more useful. Batman is the most efficient comic book character. Why is he doing this? But, yeah, it's the shorthand. It's that movie shorthand where it's like, okay, you need someone to look strong and, like, a badass, show them bench right. pressing. Never mind the fact that that isn't useful. And, and, and maybe I'm asking too much of pop culture. We, we, we need, you know, visual storytellers need shorthand. And in popular culture, a big bench press is shorthand for strong and badass. And I get it. I'm not mad at the filmmakers or the animators or the writers. I'm mad at the culture that took something useful and forsook it just because it saw really big, strong dudes in the 70s and 80s and went, oh, that's how you get big and strong, is you do this one kind of dumb, kind of dangerous exercise. Never mind the fact that a lot of those dudes were on steroids, but that's another side of it. Hey, Jackson, do you even lift, bro? So yeah. I, I wanted to talk about the bench press because I am frustrated with it and I want to do whatever I can in my part. Look, look I, there are, I, I came up with a list here and this is what I kind of want to start closing out with. There, this is a definitive ranking of people who should bench press. Number one is power lifters because the sport of power lifting involves the bench press. It's the second lift contested if, it's, if your sport involves doing the motion, do the fucking motion. Cool. Number two, bodybuilders and combine athletes. Specifically because if you're a bodybuilder, you need to build up your chest. Bench press is useful for that. If you're a combine athlete, you should train a bench press because if you want a contract, they're going to test you on it, so you may as well fucking do it. Apparently, we learned that hockey, if you want to get in on a good hockey team, you got to bench press because that combine's going to test for it. So... Fucking do it for that, and then leave it behind. If you can, never do it again. <laughs> Please, for your own benefit. And then finally, uh, number three is stubborn people <laughs> who just like it. Who are going to do it anyway. No, honestly. No, on honestly. Because I, when it comes to like any kind of exercise or anything like that, I'm very much a person who says, like, do the thing you actually enjoy. You know, I'm a weightlifter. I talk to runners who are like, oh, I could never do what you do. I, I have heard that before. I've heard that from runners. And I kind of go, that's fine. You know what? You're doing a thing that you like. You like to run. You like to do yoga. You like to do gymnastics. You like to do CrossFit. David. Hey, David. How's it going? Love you. Um, David just competed in his first Spartan race and did wonderfully. And I'm very proud of him. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, and he's already signed up for next year's Spartan race. I don't fucking ever want to do a Spartan race. <laughs> it's just an obstacle. It's four miles and obstacles and there's a there's a world in which i might do that for fun but it's not right now i don't want to do that so i'm very proud of you david for doing for finding a thing that you enjoy and that's great people should do what they like and if the activity you like is bench pressing all i'll ask is that you maybe uh a don't give it just carte blanche credence as the one measure of great strength and B, do some other stuff too, please. And please make sure that you do it correctly. Use spotters or spotting arms in a squat rack. Don't use a suicide grip. Don't hurt yourself, please, for the love of God. This is a very stupid exercise and you are choosing to do it and I will respect your choice, but please protect yourself, gentle listeners. I don't want you to die or need rotator cuff surgery or rip a peck like, Sylvester Stallone uh, reportedly got into a bench press competition with a trainer friend of his and ripped his pec out. Yeah, like he just, his pec dislodged from his chest. Because that's what bench pressing stupidly can do. Weightlifting is one of the most safe sports, one of the most safe activities you can possibly do, statistically. And all the exceptions to that. All the cases where, almost all of the cases wherein anyone gets hurt doing it is because they're bench pressing and doing it poorly. 
So I implore everyone out there, please, if you've ever thought about bench pressing, if you've ever just seen, it, it, by the way, and if you meet anyone who talks to you about bench pressing and acts like it's, you know, anything worthwhile, please direct them to me. I'll have my Twitter handle at the end of this. I will set them straight. I will fight bitches online over how useless the bench press is as an exercise. Because it is an awful exercise, and I hate it. And I want people to stop asking me if I do it. <laughs> I don't do it. Okay? So, there we go. That's that's my hate. So that's my final word on this one. Very nicely put, man. I don't think I can top your final word. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. I got I got hella niche there, and it's funny because as, as of the guys as of this recording, like we just did our we just released our Mark Wade's Daredevil and uh, Steve King episode, yeah. and I'm and I and as I was writing the copy for that, I was like, this is the most niche shit ever. <laughs> this is so like narrow casted. How is anyone gonna listen to this? Like, okay, that's fine. I I haven't checked to see how that episode is doing yet, but. Uh, I like to get niche once in a while. It, I don't know. It, it it makes me happy. No, nah, man. Niche is where it's at. We've, we've talked about this in podcasting. Niche is highly underrated, I feel like. so. And and trust me, this is not the most niche we will ever get. We we pretty much just agreed that at some point we will talk about the, the deeper meaning of The Shape of Water, the film. So. Eh, you know what? I mean... We could just do an entire thing on just Michael Shannon. Ooh, I could do that. Yo, I mean, <laughs> you talk about his minor role in Groundhog's Day. I, I just, I, I wonder how much time we could devote to the uh, reading of the sorority letter. I don't fucking cunt punt the next person I hear doing something like that. And I don't give a fuck if you SOR me. I will fucking assault you. That shit was incredible i watch that a couple times a year just because it makes me happy <laughs> all right uh moving on into the home stretch here i know we're going fairly long but i feel like this this is a relationship question we got that should be handled in relatively short order i feel like um no uh, we've said that before and it and it's gone on plenty long enough. but you know what we 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 put we pay for the space to upload these episodes, I say we fucking use it. Amen. Well then, with no further ado, here is this week's uh, relationship question. Hey guys, I have a guy friend who is like 12 years older than me. In general, we have a pretty good friendship and have become fairly close. However, he hits on me a lot and sometimes makes sexual comments that make me uncomfortable. I'm not into it. In parentheses, I'm a lesbian, but he doesn't know this. And I have tried to reject his advances with little success. When I've asked for advice on how to deal with him, I've been repeatedly told that I need to confront him directly and tell him that I'm not interested. I know that I need to do something to send a more aggressive signal to him, but I struggle a lot with being assertive and don't know how to broach this topic or choose the right time to confront him. Any advice on how to handle the situation would be much appreciated. Okay. So what we have is a young lesbian fending off the advances of an older, dumber man? That's the vibe he gives off. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have an idea for, uh, for a gnomer for this particular individual? I do. Um, so I was going to go with Sailor Uranus. Is that a Sailor Moon yes. reference? <laughs> okay. Um... Y'all, I have never watched Sailor Whoa. Moon in English. <laughs> okay. No, this is this is funny. I've only ever watched Sailor Moon in Spanish. Oh. <laughs> I watched Sailor Moon in when I was a kid visiting Colombia. It was the only thing remotely like it was the only thing I could find on TV that I knew existed in the US. Like I'm not going to call it American, but it's the one thing where I was like, I know they show this in the US. But I can't find, and I can't find anything else that I normally watch on TV. So I watched like a bunch of episodes of Sailor Moon in Spanish when I was like seven or eight, and it was weird. And that was the only exposure I ever had to Sailor Moon. <laughs> All right. But okay, Sailor Uranus. 
Is that? Can, can you give me some context yeah, on was, this character? I was like, say, like, so you must not know then. So, so it, it's actually kind of a joke. You know, the sailor in Sailor Moon, the Sailor Scouts are all based off, uh, all named off of the different planets, and Sailor Uranus yes, and Sailor Neptune are two characters who are introduced late in the show, and in original canon, are a lesbian couple. Oh, but they're sisters in the American dub. Right, they're they're cousins or sisters or something in the American dub, which leads to the hilarious, incestuous subtext in a ass backwards attempt to oh god can't have the lesbian couple, so instead we're just gonna have two sisters who like slow dance and and look at each other longingly and oh American purity. Okay, so I all right that'll work. Sailor Uranus. Uranus Penis Power! Up! Uh, I'm just gonna call you Sailor, because Uranus, I keep wanting to make butthole jokes, so... Uh, Andy, do you wanna... do you wanna start this one off? Yeah, um, and if, if it helps you, I looked it up. Sailor Uranus, the character's real first name is Haruka, so... Haruka, Uranus, hello, hello, dear listener, internet friend. Um, I am going to start by repeating the advice you've already got. You do need to correct, the, confront this person directly and tell them and make it clear that you are not interested. And it's not just that you don't play for that team. It's that, like, even if you were straight, you don't have to be interested in this person that you have a friendship who... He pretty clearly wants to make it something more, and you don't. I want to make that blatantly clear that the, you don't even need to use your sexuality as an excuse. Although, maybe that would be helpful. Um, hopefully this isn't the kind of guy who finds out somebody he is interested in is gay and then decides, oh, well, uh, there's a challenge. Uh, that would be pretty gross. Ugh. So you're dealing with problems of confrontation, and believe you me, I can relate to that. Uh, trying to find the right moment is, is often tricky, especially if you're worried about how this person that is your friend um, might react negatively. But I do think for the, the long-term health of your friendship, you need to, maybe the next time... Here, here's what I think. If you're the kind of people where you are in a larger friend group and maybe it winds up being, you know, kind of smaller parties at somebody's house or or group hangouts or something like that, I think that would be a good opportunity to take them aside and lay out the situation. The situation being that you're flattered. Maybe you're not flattered. You don't have to tell him you're flattered if you're not, but, you know, really just lay it out that you are not interested in him in the way he appears to be interested in you and you appreciate his friendship and you enjoy the relationship that you guys have, but it's not going to go anywhere beyond that. And I say to do this in a party or maybe a group setting because then you have an out to go back to where other people are and deflect and maybe minimize any any drama on his part or disappointment that he wants to work out with you because it's not your job to help him work out with any disappointment you know so that's that's what i gotta say first of all i think that's solid i'm gonna be honest sailor there and and we run into this a lot with our questions where there are details we would like to work we would like to have and we don't necessarily get those so we operate based on the things that you tell us and sometimes we may possibly read more into it than than you intend and if i'm doing that i apologize but i will say there are parts of this that kind of i'm not going to lie squeech me out you know you mentioned that he's 12 years older than you no problem no no problem there ostensibly but he's if he's 12 years older than you, I expect some degree of reasonable maturity. And if he's hitting on you, making sexual comments that make you uncomfortable, and you have at all rejected his... Like, you say you have tried to reject his advan advances with little success. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe. But uh, I feel like if someone has a friend 
who they're interested in. They make comments or make advances. And those advances are not enthusiastically followed up on, enthusiastically responded to. I feel like the instinct, the, the signal should be, oh, not interested in me, that's cool. And you leave it at that. But if he's continuing to make these remarks, he's continuing to pursue, and he's not receiving enthusiastic interest, but he still keeps on doing it, I feel like there's something concerning there. And it's not about you being a lesbian. It's not about your friendship. It's about him, because that shit isn't cool. That shit wouldn't be cool if you two weren't friends. That shit wouldn't be cool if you were witnessing it and from like a third party perspective. That's worrying. I, I, and I'm not accusing your friend of anything untoward. I just think that that's the kind of thing that needs to be called out. It's the kind of thing that needs to be, you know, addressed. Um, I like what you said, Andy, about if you have other people around. I don't know about confronting the situation in a public setting. There are people who would be who would find that more awkward than not, just because it's like, rejection sucks. Imagine being rejected publicly. Sure, sure. I, I, I guess I needed to clarify, you know, specifically what I've built up in my head is, is house party, but not house rager. And you guys can go into an adjacent room and, you know, privately have your conversation, but then it's not like you're stuck with the person. Like if you say, you know, the two of you drove out and hung out on your own and then you try to have the same breakup talk, um, you know, like in the car or something. And then you're then you're stuck with the car with a guy who you just gave some not great news. And again, I'm not trying to say that anything would happen, but I'm always about mitigating yeah. the risk because you just don't know, how, especially when you bring up these semi-worryingly qualities about the guy. Anyway. I, I'm, and I'm going to operate on the assumption that everyone here is an adult. Because with a 12-year age gap, if you're like 14 and he's 26. That's a whole other thing. Fucking, yeah. fucking, fucking run. Whereas if you're, I don't know, if you're 18 and he's 30, that's better. Everyone's an adult at least. If you're, you know, 25 and he's 37, that's more better. You know, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to shit on the age gap, but I am going to say I assume everyone here is an adult. And running on that assumption, yeah, I mean, it's... Y you ask about sending an aggressive signal. An aggressive signal is probably less necessary than just an outright no and that no being respected. And if that no is not respected, if, if I'm going to ask you to muster enough courage to just simply say, no, I'm not interested, and I don't think that's going to change. And if you are scared of his reaction from doing that, I think you need to reanalyze this relationship. Because if you have a friend, and you, and you describe this friendship as pretty good friendship, and you two are fairly close. If you're fairly close to someone, if you describe it as fairly close, and you think that they will respond poorly to you saying, hey, you're a great friend, but no, I'm not interested. If you think he's gonna react poorly to that, I ask you to take a second look at this relationship because that's, I don't know, maybe I expect too much of my friends, but if anyone is close to me and I can't just straight up tell them no on whatever thing like i'll admit romantic situations haven't really occurred for me in my friend group since i was in high school you know that's it's been over a decade since that was an issue but i i don't see how something like that should stand especially with adults and if you're shy if you're worried about it like and you need that support group I mean, fuck, if you are honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make all allowances. If you're suffering from some kind of anxiety situation, like something serious, if you just have a bad history with these kinds of moments and, I don't know, you need to fucking write a letter or use an intermediary or something like that, if it's that bad, 
okay, that's fine, do it. It's not ideal. Ideal would be a face-to-face conversation wherein the two of you just flat out, where you just flat out reject it and he accepts it. But if you can't have that and need to use some kind of intermediary messages, messages, okay. But there needs to be a definitive no. And if there's a problem in his reaction to you having a definitive no, reevaluate. Because this shit is concerning. Just based on your question. Yeah, I mean, you know, ending the friendship is an answer here. And maybe it's not the answer you want to hear. Um, you know, if he's a pretty good friend, obviously, why would you want to lose a pretty good friendship? But to, to, to think about what Alex is saying, if think about the situation, think about how one way or another, you will not wind up in a romantic relationship with this person sooner or later. That is going to come to a head that is going to play out what happens when that occurs and if it is a worrying thing or if it's going to cause a big problem you can spare the both of you heartache by biting the bullet and cutting that cord now yeah and and we express concern because Mm -hmm. we care about you dear listener and maybe this is maybe a lot of this concern is undue and maybe you know you you specifically say that you struggle with being assertive and i could see the possibility that you know this isn't he, this guy isn't as problematic as we are painting him up to be and you just struggle with passivity and you know, really, really making your own voice known. And if you can make your own voice known, he will take it just fine and, and things will, you know, work out in that regard. Maybe that's the situation. And if that is, you know, I really just, we we talked about giving you courage. I want to give you the courage to make it plain that this is not going to go past a friendship. And hopefully that works out. Hopefully the guy gets it. I mean, just to pull at straws of other solutions here. Um, maybe he just needs to put his effort somewhere else and you can assist in that. Maybe coming out and being honest about your sexuality and becoming a wingman helps reinforce your friendship you know these are for some reason i feel like these are somewhat riskier but you know there's still options but really i want you to just think about okay you you haruko uranus you know the way this is not going to go down and really think about that and really assess what that's going to do to this guy and focus on yourself and your own safety and looking out for number one from there. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, I'm just going to say, you shouldn't have to jump through hoops for your no to be heard. You don't, you don't need to come out to him. No. You don't need to... It, you don't need to go to great lengths to make sure that his feelings are coddled i'm not saying actively be hurtful but i am saying a no is a no and that's all that it should take and and that should be that and if it's any if it takes any any more than that reassess look andy's right look out for yourself yeah a no should be enough so just tell him the no directly and just say i'm not interested you're a great friend i want to stay friends no i'm not interested in you romantically and leave it at that and if it's if there's any more complication to this i think that you know where we'll stand on it yeah you know take care of yourself we don't know how old you are we love you we don't know how old you are we don't know if and 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 i and i say this because i think the younger you are, the more friendships mean to you. 
and the the um, the less likely you are to believe that friendships can come and go. So, yeah. you know, we're we're, we're going to be thinking on you, and I hope that we get a follow up to this, if for no other reason than to make sure you're okay. But. Also, I really want to be able to say Sailor Uranus again. So, So, you know, think about how you want to handle this. If you want to take our advice, I I think you need to do something. Um, And we've given you some options here. So I I hope we hear back from you, Uranus, and you let us know how you're doing and how your friendship is. And I hope it's good news. So if you, dear listener have a relationship question of your own we are more than happy to help you work through that and give you some advice um and you know we've been we've been doing a few relationship relationship questions in a row but it doesn't have to be romantic relationship it can be familial it can be um you know in the workplace it can be friendship sort of thing any anything that you could define as a relationship we are more than happy to answer your questions you can send those questions mm-hmm. to love hate relationship podcast at gmail.com and we promise we'll read them yep and you can subscribe to us and you know what rate us you know, I never ask for ratings, and we probably should. <laughs> I'm hearing that more and more that those are actually useful. So um, if you'll leave us, you know, a five-star review, a four-star review, a one-star review, probably don't leave a one-star review. If you have one-star reviews, just, like, DM us and we'll yeah, talk. we'll like, figure it out. That's fine. I'll take your hate. Or, or, you know what, like, you can just tweet directly at us that you hate us, uh, but don't actually leave it on the charts, like, Help some motherfuckers out. (laughs) Um, But you can subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and even TuneIn Radio. Hey, Mom. Uh, You can also tweet us at LHRPod. uh, That's L-H-R-P-O-D. With both your negative comments and your questions. Uh, And you can follow us there to keep up with new episodes. That's right. You can follow me, Andy Bowell, still at JovoCop2113. That's J-O-V-O-C-O-P 2113. And I'm at A underscore X underscore R-U-I-Z on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening to us. And uh, as always, please tell your enemies. (laughs) 